Good morning. Good morning, church family. How are you doing this morning? All right. So how many of you got here at 730 this morning? Anyone willing to admit that? Uh, or how, how many have forgot about daylight savings time until they got uh, Pastor Scott's call last night? Well, anyway, uh, we are excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. Uh, if you are a first-time visitor, uh, please see one of our ushers or greeters. We have a small uh, gift that we would like to uh, give to you and our appreciation for you being here uh, today. Just as a reminder, our first service at 8.30 is a mandatory mask service for those who um, uh, just want to be uh, protected um, 
in the best way possible. So we do have our first service as a um, full-time uh, mass service. Um, also a reminder, uh, pastor appreciation, uh, um, card shower. There, the basket is still in the back in case you forgot last week. Um, we, we're going to leave the basket there for one more week this week. Um, and if you forget again uh, today, just um, mail it to the church or stop by the church with your uh, card and your appreciation for both Pastor Scott and Pastor Doug and what they do for us. Um, Pastor Doug did give me uh, three announcements to go over. Uh, Operation Christmas Child. We are still in need of combs, unscented soap, washcloths, school supplies, and some small toys. Uh, if you could have these items turned in by the next two weeks, our youth group will be packaging these boxes on Sunday evening, December 15th at 6 o'clock. We've all also mentioned about if you want to do a fun family activity, you can pick up a shoebox uh, yourself and put it together uh, as a family. We have a short video clip here just to show you how that might be done. Finally. Peace and quiet. Peace and quiet. Now let's pack those Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. If you're like me, it can be difficult to know where to start. To make things easier, just start with a box. Any average size cardboard or plastic box will work, but I find a shoe box works best. After that, you'll need to decide what age group you're going to pack for, and if it's for a boy or a girl. Now let's fill that shoe box. It's best to start by selecting a wild item. Something like a soccer ball and a pump or a stuffed animal. Something that's really special. Yes and yes. Once you've got your wow item, you can start to fill it with other fun stuff like toys, clothes, sandals, or even school supplies. <laughs> what do you mean, however? However, there are some items you don't want to include. Things like gum, toothpaste, items related to war, liquids. But for a complete list, check out the website. Oh boy, I think they're gonna like this. While a shoebox might seem small and simple, it can mean the world to a child who may have never received a gift. It shows God's love in a tangible way to children in need, and together with the local church worldwide, shares the good news of Jesus Christ. This is why you will also want to personalize your shoebox. Even including a letter or a photo of your family or yourself can make it extra special to the child. The most powerful thing you can do is pray. Pray that your gift will make an impact. That both the child and the community will discover the love and name of Jesus. <laughs> when your box is finished, you can make your $9 donation online or by mailing in your contribution using the business reply envelope in the brochure. This donation is critical for training and equipping local churches to share the gospel, along with the collection, processing, and shipping of the shoebox gifts. And don't forget to activate a label so you can follow your box and discover its final destination. Finally, make sure to check the website for the closest drop-off location near you. And make sure to mark the date for the third week in November as National Collection Week. Well, there you go. You just packed yourself a shoebox. <laughs> Grandma. Already done. What? How? I thought she wasn't going to stores right now. She isn't. She packed her box online. That's right, Dad. With just a few clicks of a mouse, Grandma packed her whole shoebox online. She can choose from all kinds of gifts, even make it personal by adding a letter and a photo. Wow. So she doesn't even need to leave the house? Nope, she can stay safe inside and still have time for Doomcraft. Docking complete. Okay, there you go. If you want to pack a, your own shoe box, that, there are the instructions to do that. Um, another announcement, opportunity to serve. Uh, backyard ministries need 80 pumpkin breads for Thanksgiving this year. If you can help with this, please see Susie Wirt, and she will um, 
uh, give you instructions about what needs to be done for that. Uh, finally, our Christmas Eve love offering. It's not too soon to start thinking about this. Um, we're going to be distributing our love gift among seven different ministries this year. And we have a goal of $7,000 that we'd like to meet. So prayerfully consider how you would like to give to that project uh, this year. Um, tonight, we welcome you back tonight for our video series, uh, American Gospel, uh, Christ Crucified. It'll be here at the church at 630. Our youth group at 615. Uh, instead of the pavilion, now that it's getting a little colder, it's wet down there, and uh, it's getting dark sooner, they'll be at the gym at 615 today. So youth at the gym at 615. Uh, Wednesday Bible study with Pastor Doug. Love to see you there as well as we study uh, 1 Timothy, and that is also at the gymnasium. Well, let's open now in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love to us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for, uh, for those that are um, here at the service. Um, Lord, I, I pray that you would just uh, help us to have uh, just open hearts to um, hear what you have for us. And Lord, we want to pray for our governmental leaders, and, uh, those uh, over us in our local, our state, and our, our nation. Lord, um, I pray that you would just help them with the decisions that need to be made. Lord, this week is um, an opportunity for all of us as citizens to, to cast our vote. Lord, I pray that you'll just um, help us to um, go out and, and be able to, to do that. And Lord, I, I pray, though, for our country, as many times um, here more recently, um, riots and those kind of things have occurred. Um, after election, Lord, I pray that you'll just protect our, our country and protect our people that um, we keep them safe. And Lord, I, I pray for our service uh, this morning. Lord, incline our hearts to, to worship you. Open the eyes of our hearts to, to really see who you are. And Lord, unite our hearts, um, our whole hearts, uh, to, to understand more of you and Lord, satisfy our hearts that we may understand your joy and have complete joy uh, in you. And Lord, that the, the joy that surpasses all other joy. And Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come here and hear your word preached. And we pray for Pastor Scott as he brings forth that word that we might uh, just uh, be focused um, and willing to change anything in our lives that need to be changed um, so that we might walk a, a life that's more um, glorifying to you. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If I could ask you to stand for our scripture reading this morning. Scripture reading will be Galatians chapter 6. Verses 11 to 18. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. All who want to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised. Simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves. But they want to have you circumcised so they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And all who will follow this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And we are going to have a piano solo right before the message.
God, we, we come to you this morning. And as we've had the privilege of, of hearing the, the melody to the song, There is a Higher Throne. In those two precious verses, we are reminded, Lord, that one day and, and one day soon, that despite the brokenness, the hardships, the waywardness of a fallen man, in fact, the struggle with, with sin that we see in our own lives will, will be no more. And, and despite the, 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 the racial divide and economic divides and morality divides that we see, not just in the United States of America, but among humanity, one day, people from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue, on bended knee will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord for all of eternity. And Father God, we are looking forward to the day when, when that kingdom will be fully realized, where you will rule in righteousness and power and truth. And Lord, the things that we struggle with won't even be a memory for us. But until that day comes, Father, help us not to remember that while we may await that kingdom's full realization, in Christ we're already those kingdom citizens. And you have called us as we allow the life of Christ to, to live, to rule and to reign through us, to live in such a way that those who are outside your kingdom might see what kingdom living looks like through us. And you've called us to occupy until you come. And so Lord God, until you call us home to glory, or at the, at the rapture of the church, you call your bride home. We've got a job to do. And, and by your grace and through your spirit's enablement, Lord, I ask that you would give us the courage, the, the want and the desire to do it well for your honor, for your glory, for your praise. Father, as we continue to study in our lesson today, we will be looking a little more in depth at what the apostle Paul wanted in reference to the church in Galatia. Once they were in Christ, it was no more about glorying in themselves, looking to themselves for their own sufficiency, building a name and a reputation for them. But in Christ, it became about the honor and the glory of God to genuinely fix their eyes for all eternity onto the coming kingdom, your kingdom, and to allow your spirit to squelch out anything in their lives that stood in the way. Lord, I thank you for the truth that Paul sounded forth to that church many years ago. And by your gracious provision, you continue to sound forth through your word today. And so we ask, Lord God, that as your people, that you would give us ears to hear, softened hearts ready to receive the word of God, that not only made us wise to salvation, but grows us, shapes us, and transforms us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, Robin. Good morning. All right, now I realize you got an extra hour of sleep. Most of you realize that you should set your clock back because you're here. We're going to try that one more time because there should be a whole lot more enthusiasm from the household of faith with an extra hour of sleep. Good morning. Much better. Thank you, Jared. Really appreciate that enthusiasm. We're going to continue here. We, we only have two messages left in the study in Galatians. Um, personally, in my own walk, it's been a, a great reminder. As we've poured through these six chapters, verse by verse, to what God has called us to as his people. Genuinely, what we've been saved from and what we've been saved to. And as we, we look in, in a few verses here this morning, continuing our series, Freedom in Christ, we're going to look at the second part in our message, cross-centered living. Last week, we looked at the depths that false teachers, not just in Paul's day, but in our day today, but the depths that false teachers are willing to go to build a name for themselves, all for the purpose of padding their own ministry numbers, Unfortunately, at the expense of those who will follow their ways. 
as I had an opportunity to, to, to study this week, uh, just personal study, I came across a passage in Titus where, where Paul is writing to uh, Titus who has been left behind on the island of Crete, much like Timothy had been left at Ephesus to minister and to lead the church there. Titus, who had been with Paul uh, in his missionary journeys, was left at the island of Crete to do the same. And not only was he called to appoint elders who would, who would lead and guide the church in a right way, but he was also given a message of warning for those who would come, come, come from without, but also those who were from within who would hold back the ministry of the church through the false teaching we've been talking about. In Titus 1, starting in verse 10, Paul said this to, to young Titus, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. That should sound very familiar to us. You know, th there was nothing new under the sun in Paul's day. Wherever he had planted a church, there was always opposition that would rise up against it, trying to get the people to go back to the life they used to live. But we see the, 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 the end of, of what their game was. It wasn't for the glory of God. It wasn't for the good of the people, but for the sake of sordid gain. The, new, the King James says, filthy lucre, dishonest gain. Verse 12, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. He said, this testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. As I thought about that, that passage of scripture, you know, it really did capture what we looked at last week in reference to the, and really what we've studied throughout the entire series in the book of Galatians in reference to the false teachers, the Judaizers, who were teaching against what the apostle Paul had not only proclaimed, but faithfully lived out before them. But for the false teachers and those false teachers today, again, a, an invitation to come this evening at 630, uh, a few weeks left in that uh, series and whatever that you would watch will be helpful, I assure you, in helping to build discernment as far as to what we should give ear to, not only for ourselves, but for, for our families. But for the false teachers, they were only in it for the money. And, and as they were looking to not just build a name, but to pad their pockets, they did it at the expense of causing entire households to stumble. And, and that's very important. You know, if they could get the people deceived. Remember, they were braggers who boasted in themselves. They were compromisers who would speak half-truths, but would bend the truth for their own means. They, they were manipulators who, they, you know, it sounded really good. It almost sounded like the truth. But really, they were just manipulating those who would give ear to their pernicious ways to make merchandise of them. And really, the reason was their own status and reputation. You see, in Paul's day, the reason the Judaizers were doing it didn't hinge on the spiritual condition of the people. Frankly, it didn't even hinge on the spiritual condition of themselves. That's probably what may be, may be a little more heartbreaking about that. And they only in it for themselves, they refused to identify themselves with the cross. As we shared last week, to identify ourselves with the cross meant to identify with the persecution that such identification would bring. And despite the fact that they, were, they would say they were Christ, as, as Paul told Titus, they proved themselves to be reprobates, good for nothing. And, and what a heartbreaking commentary. And as you think about, as Paul challenged the Galatians at the end of his letter, verse 13, not on the screen, just, just follow along. You're welcome to turn to Galatians 6 with me here. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Even when they mention the name of Christ, they're mentioning a Savior they don't even intend to follow themselves. And so there's a stark contrast. And I said last week, we looked at the Judaizers. This week, we'll look at Paul 
and the, the life and the ministry he's called us to in the church. And, and when, you, when you think about the stark contrast, his willingness to suffer, we saw that in verse 14, with that of those who weren't, weren't willing to suffer at all. An illustration, very secular, but very, uh, very apt for us this morning. John Audubon, the well-known naturalist and artist, practiced great self-mastery in order to learn more about birds. Counting his physical comforts is absolutely nothing. He would rise at midnight, night after night, and go out into the swamps to study certain nighthawks. He would crouch motionless in the dark and the fog, hoping to discover just one more additional fact about a single species. During one summer, Audubon repeatedly visited the bayous near New Orleans to observe a shy water bird. He would stand almost to his neck in stagnant water, scarcely breathing, while venomous water moccasins swam past his face. It was not comfortable or pleasant, but he beamed with enthusiasm and is reported to have said these words in reference to what he went through. But what of that? I have the picture of the birds, after all. You know, so what of it standing in the stagnant water up to my neck with venomous water moccasins that could kill me with one puncture of my flesh? What of getting up every night, night after night at midnight to go out just to maybe catch a glimpse of one of these birds? He's like, what of that? The commentator went on to say he endured all of these just for a picture. If a man could be so disciplined for a temporal and physical reward, how much more committed should the child of God be for the imperishable prize before him? He's, it, it, the commentator's not wrong. If Audubon will go out and risk life and limb just to catch a glimpse of a nighthawk, unlike the Judaizers who were unwilling to link themselves to the cross because of the suffering that comes with genuinely being a Christ follower, how much more should us having the imperishable prize, Christ himself, compel us to not only identify ourselves, but we'll see next week be willing to suffer for the sake of the cross. And that is precisely what we see as Paul not only shares this, this powerful ending to the letter to the Galatians, but really throughout his entire ministry. Some scriptures on the screen here, powerful scriptures. In Philippians 1.21, Paul said this as he's chained 24 hours a day to a Roman praetorian guard. He says, for me to live is Christ. Listen, we could talk about that statement for the next three months of what it means to live being Christ. Paul says, my life, for me to live is Jesus Christ. Think about who Christ is. Think about what Christ did. Think about how Christ lived. Think about how and what Christ sacrificed. Think about the humility that Christ displayed. Think about the willingness Christ had to suffer for no wrong of his own. for the salvation and the restoration of fallen man but most importantly for the glory of God Paul says for to me to live is Christ to die is gain what a stark contrast to the ones who they want to make a name for themselves and they'll talk the name of Jesus but they refuse to link themselves to the call and the cost of the cross because of the suffering that will come with it. But Paul says, for me to die is gain. In Philippians 3, verses 7 through 8, Paul, who in his day, you, know, you could read back in chapter 1, remember he was the one more zealous than those of his own people, those as equals, and, and, and how he had surpassed them all. And despite the position he had once held, humanly speaking, Paul says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yes, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, but rubbish that I may win Christ. 
If you come on Sunday nights, you will see that there are many in this world, and there may be even some in this room, that, that we like what we can get by being connected to Christ. We, we like what we might get by being associated with Christ, or even we aspire to get what we think we can get if we just you know, kind of hang out in the circle of Christ. But Paul says, I'm not interested in what I can get from him. He said, I'm willing to lay it all down, and I've sacrificed, counted it all as scubula, dung, a big steaming pile of manure that I might have him. And when Jesus Christ is the prize of your life, I promise you it will transform every area as we allow it. To the point that not only will you link yourself to Christ, not being ashamed to be identified if it costs you your reputation, your friendships, your job potentially. What about our lives? In Acts chapter 21, verses 13 through 14, Paul is meeting with some fellow ministers, companions who had ministered with him throughout his three missionary journeys. He's in Caesarea preparing to go to Jerusalem, and as they're conversing, a prophet named Agabus binds Paul's hands and, and reminds him that this is the bondage that awaits you, Paul. Paul had already told the Ephesian elders he didn't think he'd ever see them again. And as this prophet binds the hands of Paul, the cost of being a disciple, a church planner, a pastor for Jesus Christ, Verse 13 of Acts 21, despite their pleas for him to stay, to not go. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I don't think we can grab deeply enough the intensity with which Paul wrote the, the letter to the Galatians. If you're a parent that has a child that's going in a wayward direction, you probably can identify. You could probably identify well that despite the depth of your love for them, your aspiration that they'll do that which is pleasing to God and what's good for them, they, they persist to keep going. And, and you could probably identify yourselves with the passionate pleas and, and the depth of heart that, that any kind of attempt that you would use to, to reach them would be fueled by. And that's what we see from Paul as he's writing this letter, as he's wrapping it up. And throughout Paul's entire ministry, he wants them to understand that the prize genuinely is Christ being identified with him, living for him, your life through him, for, for his honor and for his glory and for his praise. In verse 14 of Galatians 6, despite the fact that that in the flesh man likes to glory in himself. Paul says this, but God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Last week we talked about, our point was that a cross-centered life is centered on Christ, not self. A cross-centered life for those who are in Christ. You, know, you can think of in Philippians chapter 3, not on your screen, but just listen to these words. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says this in reference to having let go of everything, counting it as dung in light of the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ. He says this in verse 12, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend or lay hold of, that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul's life, from the moment he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road until he breathed his last as he was martyred, was to no longer live for himself, but to live for Christ and before others. He now lived a life as imperfect as he was. You can read in Romans 7. We'll talk about that in a minute. Paul wasn't perfect. He struggled with the sin nature. But his focus, his purpose, his vision in this life was clear. 
His life was centered on Christ and his glory, not his own. And, and when that's the case, we have a life that's centered on God and Christ and his glory and not ourselves. Point number two is that a cross-centered life finds its focus on the person and the work of the cross. It's the only way you and I will have a life centered on Christ if we keep a laser focus on Christ and the cross in this life. In verse 14, Paul starts out with these words, but God forbid that I should glory. What you will find if you study this in any depth at all, there isn't a stronger Greek negative that Paul could use in this verse. This is the strongest statement, negative statement he could make. And, and really what it says is, may it never be. Like, like, God forbid, there is absolutely no way that I should glory, that I should boast in anything but the cross. Nothing in this life compares to the ministry, to the power, to the glory of the cross and the, wor and the, cr and the work that took place there through Christ. And using this strong Greek negative, Paul drives home his point to his Galatian audience, and God's preserved it for you and I today, that as the Christian, if we're going to boast in anything in this life, anything. It's not in our achievements. It's not in our houses. It's not in our retirement plans. It's not in the direction of an economy. It's not in anything that we could do in this life. For the Christian to glory to boast, it's to boast in nothing but the cross. Three, three brief points here this morning. Of, of kind of how we can keep a perspective to make sure that we check the glory in ourselves, but rather glory in Christ. And what we'll see, we'll, we'll go ahead and use the life of the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the Galatians. The first thing that we're going to see is when we consider who we were when we came to Christ, we find no place for glorying in ourselves. When we consider who we were when we came to Christ, we find no place place for glorying in ourselves. In 1 Timothy 1.15, the Apostle Paul says this, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And, and I genuinely appreciate the words that, that Paul writes to Timothy in this letter because Paul doesn't say, and I know we've said this before, that you know, Christ came to die for sinners of, of whom I used to be chief. You know, when I used to struggle with sin, Paul says, like, presently, Christ came to die for sinners of whom I am currently right now. Paul saw himself as the vilest offender of Christ and his cross. And it would be so easy, and again, this scripture, not on your screen, but going back to a text that we studied in the book of Galatians. We, we, we read these words where, where Paul says this, in verse 22 of Galatians 1, after having spent three years in the wilderness, ended up going back to Jerusalem for a time. And it says in verse 22, And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. It would be easy for Paul to, to gloat in his achievements. It would be easy for Paul to be puffed up like, man, look where I used to be, but man, look where I'm at now. I mean, they're glorifying God in me. But Paul could keep glory in Christ in the cross because he never forgot who he was when Christ saved him. In fact, a powerful, powerful scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. From my own lips, I've said he's probably the greatest church planner this world has ever seen. If, if we could be anyone except Christ... As we read in the scriptures, you know, maybe it's a Daniel. We'd probably say we'd like to be like the Apostle Paul with the influence and the courage. And yet that Apostle Paul says, for I am the least of the apostles. That I'm not fit to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. Did Paul wallow in his misery? Absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. He even says in Philippians 3, forgetting what was in the past and pressing on for what lies ahead, that upward call in Christ. But he didn't just remember who he was when Christ saved him. Secondly, when we consider our eternal state without him, we find there is no place for glorying in our selves. And in fact, if we go back to Psalm 73, if there's something that, that I've heard, and maybe it's the culture in which we're living today, in reference to, to living for Christ, the suffering that goes with that, the seeming endless sacrifices that, that some feel they've been called to make in light of the world around them, you know, it looks like the wicked are prospering, doesn't it? They get what they want. They drive the nice cars. They have the nice houses. And, and they seem to be left alone. And it seems like everything's going their way. Listen, that temptation is, is as strong now as it was then. In fact, that's the allure of the world that Satan would use to sidetrack you and your dependence upon Christ and your willingness to align yourself with the suffering that goes with the cross. And in Psalm 73, in the first 17 verses, we, we read a passage of Scripture written by Asaph, one of the, the temple worship leaders. If there is anyone who should have understood the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, and the salvation of God, it should be that person leading the worship in the temple. Amen? And yet what we find is that man is still a man, and he looks out around the world, and he sees the seemingly easy life of the unregenerate. And listen to the words that he says. I appreciate that in hindsight as he writes this, he writes the truth. Verse 1, surely God is good to Israel. And I want you to know God is not only good to Israel, he has been good to you. He has extended the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. He has extended the gift of redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And he has granted unto us a walk and a relationship with, with the king of glory, Christ himself. So these words are true. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But listen to what had happened before. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Can you relate? You look around at the world around you. They have the relationships. They have the wealth. They have the, the economic provisions. They have the jobs. Verse 4, for there are no pains in their death. Seemingly life is easy and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace, their garment of violence covers them, their eye bulges from fatness, the imaginations of their heart run riot, they mock and wickedly speak of oppression, they speak from on high, they have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Verse 10, therefore his people, who are his people? Those who follow the wicked man. Therefore his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease they have increased in wealth. Listen to what Asaph, the temple worship leader, says. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Here is someone who should have known the commitment that it took to stand for God in a fallen pagan world. But actually feels like it may have been in vain. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Please, child of God, hear this. Don't think for one instance that this life will be easy to stand for Christ. Standing for Christ and standing upon God and his word is the hardest thing you will do because Satan, the enemy of our faith, the enemy of Christ, although soundly defeated at the cross, will stop at nothing to try to divert you and I and our commitment to Christ. It will not make it easy for us. Verse 15, if I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. You know, Asaph had a dilemma here. I mean, he, he knows the life he's been called to, even the life he's been teaching to the people who will give ear as they praise God together in the temple. Yet he sees the apparent blessing of the wicked. 
And that is why it is, we have to be so careful that we don't equate the material blessing of this world with favor with God. Just because things aren't easy, just because things are hard, and, and you know what, there's, there's opposition that's come your way. Somehow, does that mean you've fallen out of God's good graces? No, it may mean you're smack dab in the middle where you're supposed to be. As I share with you, Paul didn't just know where he was when Christ found him. He knew eternally where he'd be without him. And that is precisely what got the attention of Asaph, who almost stumbled himself. He said, my, remember verse 2, my feet came close to stumbling. Verse 17, until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. The ways of the wicked in the world around us may seem appealing, and to your flesh they will. To boast in the things they boast in, to grasp for the things they grasp for, to relish and roll in the things that they do, it's appealing to the flesh. But Paul could glory in the cross, separating himself from such boasting and glory and reveling, because he genuinely knew that apart from the cross, without the work that Christ had done, where he would be, not only now, but for all eternity. In Ephesians in chapter 2, we'll get to verse 11, which will be on your screen. But listen to verses 1 through 3. Is, is Paul writes to the Jewish and, and also mostly Gentile believers in the Ephesian church. In verse 1, he says, And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. He, he says, listen, I want you to remember which road you used to walk. He's like, I, I want you to remember those things that you used to do. And he goes on to say, among whom also we all had our conversation, our way of life in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And what Paul says, listen, there was a moment in time when, when you were hell bent and hell bound. And, and you're going to see verse 11 here, apart from the work of Christ, this is where they were. Wherefore, remember. Why do we need to remember? Because we forget so easily. When I said, going back about four months ago, that I was grateful for the pause that we were all forced to take in this life, I meant that and I stand on that today. We need the interruptions in our lives that remind us of where our hearts and eyes focus must and should be. I keep hearing the, the words, let's, let's run back to normal, and yet running back to normal will lead us right back to where we used to be. And the flesh inside of us hates that, the thought that we won't go back to normal. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he didn't want them to go back to normal. Paul wrote to the Romans. He didn't want them to go back to the old normal. He wrote to the Philippians because he didn't want them to go back to the old normal. He wrote to the Galatians. He didn't want them to go back to the old normal. The author of Hebrews, I think it might be Paul, wrote to them because they were going back to the old normal. But don't forget where we would have been without that cross. In verse 11, wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time you were without Christ. There was a moment in your life that you didn't have Christ. You were far from him. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Apart from what Christ did on that cross, having no hope, and without God in the world. Spiritually speaking, we were dead as a doornail. Nothing that we could do, no amount of piety that we could muster up that could save us from the wrath that was ours. 
But verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off or made nigh or brought near by the blood of Christ. But think about Paul. As he, as he wrestled with the, the battle between the flesh and the spirit in Romans 7, he says, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He said, but I give thanks through Jesus Christ, my Lord. That leads us to our third point. When we consider Christ's work on the cross, the victory of Christ's work on the cross, we find there's no place for glorying in our Selves. As Warren Wearsby stated very aptly, he said this, Paul could glory in the cross because he knew the person of the cross, the power of the cross, and the purpose of the cross. And so as we look at the very first thing that Wearsby said, why Paul could glory, he said he knew the person of the cross. When, when you think about this, you going back to the text, Paul says this, but God forbid that I should glory. May it never be that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. We see that through the person of Christ, this transaction has taken place. We're now once a part of the world, not just living in it, but a part of it living for it. Paul says, listen, the world's been crucified to me and I to the world because of Christ. When you think about the, the focus of, of who Christ is and what he really came to do, and it's very easy in a modern church culture to think that Christ came to give you an easy life. Christ came so that you'd never need medical care. Christ came so that you would never have to struggle vocationally. Christ came so that you could have the six-digit salary that a local, not a local, a, 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 a famous, he doesn't even call himself a pastor, so I won't even give him that term, encourager, has said God wants you to have. But John the Baptist knew why Jesus came. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist, who willingly gave his life as well at the hands of Herod, as the Son of God was approaching him. In John 1, 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Again, going back to context, referred to as a lamb, the lambs were sacrificed repeatedly in Jewish culture. The temple grounds were stained with the blood of lambs, of rams, and goats, and pigeons, and doves. But all that would be rendered unnecessary with the coming of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Jesus himself identified himself in Mark 10, 45, saying these words, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, when you read in Galatians 6, 14, as Paul is calling the hearts and the minds of the Galatians to remember where the source of their glory should be, Paul can glory in Christ and the cross because he knows what Christ has done on his behalf. So Paul says, God forbid that I glory, that I boast in anything but Christ and his cross. But you see, the false teachers, they couldn't, glory or boast in the cross because they didn't glory or boast in Christ. And they didn't have room to glory and boast in Christ because they were too busy boasting themselves. Paul knew the person of the cross. But Paul also knew the power of the cross. You see, the cross, as we shared in first century Christendom, wasn't like it is today. You didn't just wear it as freely, openly as we do. In fact, they wouldn't do that. It was a sign of derision, of shame, of sin. It was a curse. And as ashamed of the cross and as unwilling to suffer for the cross as the Judaizers and so many were, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.23, but we preach Christ crucified. 
We don't preach health, wealth, and prosperity. We preach Christ crucified. And why was Christ crucified? To take away the sin of the world. Why did Jesus say he came? To give his life a ransom for many. John 17, that God would be glorified and man might know what eternal life is. But you see, the problem was that to the Jews, it was a stumbling block because anyone who died on a cross was accursed. And to the Greeks, it was foolishness. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says to the Corinthian church, for the message of the cross. And the message of the cross encompasses all that Christ came to do. It encompasses the incarnation where the Son of God, the King of glory, the Eternal One, left the right hand of the Father, took on the flesh of man, lived a sinless life to die a sinner's death. So that three days later he could rise again, ascend back to the right hand of the Father, send the Holy Spirit so that we could be sealed for eternity. And Paul says, for the message of the cross, his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, the sending of the Spirit, the soon return, is foolishness to those who are perishing. If you want to know where somebody stands, ask them what they think about the cross. And if you want people to know who the Christ is in your life, tell them about the cross. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As we've read throughout our study, the power of God through the cross had set Paul free from a number of things. If you were to go back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says this, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Through the power of, cross, Paul, through the power of the cross, Paul had been set free from himself. Don't you look forward to the day when that victory over those thought lives struggles with the hidden sins that maybe no one else knows, but we do, God does, will be no more. The wrestling match will be over. Paul's like the power of the cross. It may not be easy, but the fight's been won through Christ. We can have victory now as the life of Christ has lived through us. Paul had been set free from himself. He'd also been set free from the crippling power of the flesh. Verse 24 of chapter 5, Paul says, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You know what? All those things that drove the Judaizers, glory in themselves, padding their numbers, all at the expense and, and, and really the abuse of those who would give sway to them. Paul says, like, That's been put to death. That is who I used to be. But he'd been set free. As we see in verse 14 of chapter 6, again, Paul adamantly declares, but God forbid, may it never be that I should glory or boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul been set free from the lusts and the powerful lure of the fallen system around him. And that leads us to the third thing that Paul knew about the cross. He knew the person, he knew the power, and he knew the purpose. I appreciate that Paul ends this letter as he says in chapter 6, verse 14, that the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world the same way he began it. In Galatians 1, verses 3 through 5, we don't have this ooey and gooey greeting. We have this heavy hitting right hook right off the bat where he says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. The word deliver means to tear out. It's like in this like savage, like vicious, violent way, like to tear out, to pluck out, to rescue and if you've ever been on a rescue mission, I have not been, so to speak. But many in our armed forces, they have been on rescue missions. And when they risk life and limb to go in and to rescue someone and to tear them out of that situation, they don't do it so they can willingly run back into bondage. They do it so that they can be free. 
and live in that freedom. Paul ends the letter the same way he started it, reminding them that Christ came to set you free from your sin and to deliver you from the draw and the pull of this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father by God's plan for God's glory. Verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul says, I glory in the cross because through the cross he saved me from this world. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. Why did Paul boast the cross? And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, has he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. In verse 14, listen to these words, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Everyone who was crucified on a cross had a, had a, had a plate nailed above them that, that would show everyone who went by really as a challenge and a reminder to not go the same way as this victim had, as a reminder of the charges they died for. And what it says here is that through the work of the cross, through Christ's uh, sacrificial death, making atonement for you and I on the cross in our place, it says he's blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, all the sins that we are guilty of, we're, we're guilty of, and will, will be guilty for. Christ in one act, it says blotted it out. He, he wiped it away. Every charge that was against us. Verse 14 says, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Staying in the book of Colossians, we see the purpose of the cross as Paul writes to the believers in Colossae and he says this, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. As you read verses 14 to 15 in Galatians 6 again, in light of where you were when Christ found you, in light of where you'd be for eternity apart from what Christ did for you, in light of the victory that was won on our behalf, thinking about the person, the power, and the purpose of the cross, listen to these words again. But God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything, neither circumcision matters nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. As Paul concluded this letter, and, we'll, and we will conclude next week, Paul understood the life that he once lived. Paul understood the, 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 the hopeless desperation that he once faced. But now redeemed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God from on high, Paul refused to go back to a dead end way of living. And he implored all who would give ear to refuse to do the same. Father, we, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that even though we live in the midst of a world where truth has become relevant, whatever I want to believe is true, or you want to believe is true, or they want to believe is true, it's true. And yet that doesn't fly in reference to not only what the word of God says, but in light of what the Christian is called to live. And Father, in the midst of such hypocrisy, nationally and locally, and even within the body of Christ, would you help us to keep a laser-like focus on you? Lord, as your Holy Spirit continues to draw us, comfort us, and conform us to, to the image of Christ, would you help us to boast in nothing but the cross? 
genuinely remembering who we used to be. Not so we can wallow in it, so that we don't repeat it. Lord, reminding us of where we would spend eternity if it weren't for the cross. Because in so doing, we remember the victory that Christ won. We remember the person of the cross, the power of the cross, and the purpose of the cross. And, and, and then we realize that the reason why Paul could say that if he was going to glory, it would be a nothing but the cross. Because apart from the cross of Calvary and the work that Christ performed on our, our behalf, we were without Christ, separated from God, without hope, in desperation and despair, and headed for hell. But God who is rich in mercy, sent his son. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place, to make payment for our sins. You died our death so that we could live your life, became a curse so we could be robed in your righteousness. You died and, and, and resurrected from that grave, ascended back to the right hand of the Father so that we could enter one day too. And Father, as we live the, the remainder of these earthly lives, help us to not forget that. And to not forget what that life has called us to do. Who it's calling us to be. And what it's calling us to give. And as we listen to this last hymn, as Isaac Watts wrote, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, May we be quick as your people to go back and do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My riches gain, I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my
Father, please forgive us. Lord, we, we fail so many times, and Lord, we glorify in ourselves so many times. We've, our focus is on ourselves so often, and Lord, I, I thank you for this reminder as uh, Pastor Scott just uh, preached to us, and, 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 and as Paul had uh, explained uh, to, the, to the Galatians, Lord, that we need to uh, focus on the, the cross, the person of the cross, and Lord, the, the power of the cross and, and the purpose of the cross as well. Lord, help us to, to do that as we go through our daily lives, as we um, uh, talk with our friends and family, and Lord, that we so apt are to glorify in ourselves, but Lord, help us to glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, this side may be dismissed.